Film noir is just a French term for dark cinema that came out of some novels. Siri noir came out of some novels, and in uh, novels, a lot of times, uh, people are writing in the first person. We talked about the first person versus third person uh, in an earlier class, and a number of these movies are rep are based on books that were written in the first person, so they're going to replicate that in, uh, in uh, the film by having voiceover narration. Okay, so we get some nice tropes. We've talked about tropes already with musicals and with westerns and things like that. So in film noir, we get moral ambiguity, right? Who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? And are the good guys really good? And are the bad guys really bad? And so on. Uh, we're also going to get voiceover, like I said, which replicates writing in the first person, if it were a book. We get femme fatales, the fatal woman. And, you know, that's kind of cool because um, a lot of actors like to play the bad guy. I mean, that's really a good part to play for, for actors and actresses. And in horror movies of the 30s and 40s, a lot of times women have to get rescued, right, from the monster, from, from Frankenstein or Dracula or something like that. But in film noir, they are uh, kind of in charge and they're the smart ones. And a lot of times the guys are way behind the women. The women are way ahead uh, in terms of planning. Now, they're not always good. They're not always good. Sometimes they're, they're fatal, right? But uh, basically, uh, it's, a, it's a, a good genre for women. They tend to do really well and have, uh, you know, lots of lines and lots of, lots of the plot and all that. Also, we get cigarettes, for sure. It's the 40s. Lots of cigarettes and cigarette smoke. And... As bad as cigarette smoke is for our lungs, we all know that, it looks really cool photographically, okay? So at some point, somebody's going to have to figure out a totally non-lethal, non-toxic uh, way to smoke because smoke looks kind of cool, uh, but uh, of course it ruins our lungs. So uh, anyway, um, they didn't know all about that back in the 30s and 40s. Uh, neon. Uh, a lot of this uh, takes place in cities, uh, a little bit claustrophobic and so on, things closing in, usually violence and crime, but importantly, not gangsters. So not The Godfather or Scarface or Goodfellas. Those are not noir movies. Those are, those are gangster movies. It's a whole kind of different genre, even though they're both crime-related. Crime and they are often but not always be movies um, meaning that they don't always have the biggest stars and they don't always have the biggest budgets and matter of fact all of this dark lighting is actually helpful on a low-budget movie you don't have to make as many make as many sets and things like that it actually kind of helps out uh, with uh, with low-budget type movies and lots of shadows very evocative wonderful black and white photography this is definitely one of the genres along with horror that I really would not want to see in color. It's just gorgeous in black and white. It really is. And this picture kind of shows it. It's really wonderful stuff in black and white. Um, but sometimes they are A movies, right? Sometimes they're with big stars and big directors and all that. Um, a couple that we're going to see today are actually uh, from uh, big directors and things. Um, Billy Wilder. But often they're B movies. Um, and over the years, we have sort of gotten a new found respect for these wonderful uh, noir films. So uh, right about here is where I would show the documentary, Bringing Darkness to Light. I think the entire documentary is on YouTube. I usually show about the first 10 or 12 minutes of the documentary. So... This would be a good time, really, if you want to pause and then, and then uh, type in Bringing Darkness to Light or Film Noir, Bringing Darkness to Light, and that'll bring up, luckily, the entire video. So if you're into it, you can watch the entire uh, 80 or 90 minute thing on Film Noir documentary. It's quite good. And if not, then I would be showing in class about the first 15 minutes or so. 
of, uh, of the documentary Bringing Darkness to Light. Then, after that, I would switch over to Double Indemnity, which is from one of our prime directors, and I think I told you already that this class is very director-centric, and very auteur-driven. Billy Wilder is probably our first director of the semester, and he came to the U.S. escaping uh, Europe and the Nazis in the 30s. Uh, English wasn't his first language, but his scripts are so amazing. Uh, what he does with dialogue, you, you just hardly can believe the wonderful verbal interplay that they have. Uh, and in the scene, I would be showing uh, the very beginning of the film, and we're going to see our protagonist here, who he's only got one thing on his mind, really, her, and uh, getting her in the sack, as they say. Um, and she's way ahead of him. She's like 10 steps ahead. He's playing checkers, and she's playing, I don't know, three-dimensional chess. She's way ahead of him, and she's definitely a film, a femme fatale, definitely a femme fatale. Really, really evil. But it's a great, juicy part for Barbara Stanwyck there, and that's Fred Astaire on the left. Uh, and they're going to have this... Uh, in this scene, if you watch it, they're going to have this wonderful conversation, and it's um, a lot full of lots of innuendo. He is selling car insurance, so they're going to have this conversation about how fast was I going, officer, and things like that. So suppose you get down off your motorcycle. So they're going to have this conversation sort of rely, uh, relating to cars since he's selling car insurance. Uh, but, of course, they're talking about other stuff. And uh, and we're going to get voiceover for sure. And he's going to have a great line. I don't know if you're going to see it or not. How, how could I know that death could smell like... Oh, and he names a flower, and I'm trying to remember the name of the flower. Um, I don't know, echamellias or something. Uh, but anyway, um, it's, we're going to have a framing device. Okay, so at the very beginning of the film, he the, there's a taxi cab racing through the streets of LA, and he gets out, and he uh, goes into a, a building where he works, an insurance building, and rides up the elevator and goes in, and he's got a little, a little spot. It's not very big, but he's got a spot in his, uh, on his chest there, and that's where he's been shot. That's where he's been shot, so he won't be using his left hand throughout all that. And he's going to light a cigarette, of course. He's going to light a cigarette. It's all nice and dark and moody. And then he's going to start doing uh, voiceover into a recording device in the uh, in the office. It's, it's an early dictation sort of a machine. And that's where we're going to get him telling the story uh, in voiceover. So that's going to frame the story. We know that he's been shot. Now, who shot him and how he got shot and all that, that's kind of the mystery that's going to have to get solved. Okay, well, we can kind of guess that likely she shot him, but we still don't know. We still don't know uh, her fate or anything like that. Um, a little bit of a spoiler alert. I will tell you that since this is in the 1940s, that the, the, the uh, Hayes Code, it was named after Will Hayes, uh, that uh, ran it, and it was and it was put up by the studios, so it was self censorship. They wouldn't allow for anybody to get away with murder. Okay, now today you can have the sort of things where the bad guy gets away with it or something like that. And then some of the remakes in the '80s and and uh, '90s and so on. Yeah, yeah, people can get actually get away with murder. Uh, but no, he's he's not going to get away, and she's not going to get away because that's the way the code was back then. But it's still a great movie to find out how they come together, and then eventually uh, fall apart, right? They're, this whole plan, this whole plan is uh, going to fall apart. And double indemnity is like a, an insurance policy. It pays double if the policyholder dies at work, I think it is. And I think when they go to uh, kill her husband, he's traveling to a work related event. I think that's it. I can't remember exactly, but anyway, the, it's an insurance policy term, double indemnity, and so he's, uh, his policy is maybe going to pay double. Okay, and uh, really classic all-time film noir. Wonderful movie. 
All right. Uh, and if you get a chance, then track down Body Heat from 1981. Uh, certainly, it, well, it's R-rated. You can probably tell from that. And uh, so nudity and language and all that, and possibly even getting away with the crime. Uh, I don't want to give too much away. It's a fantastic movie, uh, but it's definitely neo-noir. Regular film noir would be the 40s and 50s. This is definitely neo-noir, new noir. Uh, and it has a wonderful opening, and they are sort of talking um, a little raunchier than they did in the 1940s, but they're going to be talking in that sort of um, double entendre uh, way, you know, talking about one thing but meaning something else. So I would show about the first five minutes of that film uh, next. It's really wonderful. Then we would go back to Billy Wilder and Sunset Boulevard from 1950, and this one also has a framing device, and we're going to hear this guy right here, this poor writer, he's going to say um, when he describes who got killed, just a, just a writer with a couple of B pictures to his credit. And he's going to be referring to himself. So at the beginning, it's interesting, he's going to start talking about uh, that the, the police raced to the home of a silent movie star and they found this guy floating in the pool uh, one shot in his, two shots in his back, one shot in his stomach, something like that, uh, floating face down in the swimming pool. They got that shot by putting a mirror on the bottom of the pool, apparently. I guess they didn't have underwater cameras back then. And um, it is a silent uh, movie star from the 1930s, Norma Desmond, and so many classic lines. I'm ready for my close-up. Mr. DeMille is uh, in this film, and the actual Cecil B. DeMille, who was a big-time director back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, and so on, is in this. And the uh, Hayes office wasn't crazy about the original opening for the film. And the original opening for the film it apparently was going to take place at a morgue, and um, I guess the, the attendant was going to leave, and then the, the uh, bodies would sit up, I guess, on the slabs or something like that, and start talking, how did you die? Oh, my, my girlfriend's husband shot me, or something like that, or car accident. And then this guy was going to say, well, have you ever heard of, you know, Norma Desmond, the famous movie star? And then he tells his story from the beyond, basically. And I guess they thought that was a little too, um, little too gruesome. So uh, I don't know how this is less gruesome than a morgue, but I guess it is. Uh, and he's at a swimming pool. And then they, we would see that he was a B picture writer. He uh, has the repo men on his tail. And he gets a flat tire while he's fleeing them and pulls into her large, rather large, but really run down, uh, at least the grounds are, uh, a state, the swimming pool's empty and, and, and nothing's been watered or anything like that. And then he meets her and uh, they have a wonderful conversation. It's a great scene. That, that's, a, that's a good one to watch. And um, we're going to see that Norma's a little bit delusional and all of that. And um, he's going to sort of get pulled in to her, to her web. Uh, and she has a a butler, manservant, sort of taking care of her, and uh, they are expecting someone else, and it's a it's a great scene. And then she's going to find out he's a writer and tell him that she's got a script uh, that's ready, and she's going to send it to Mr. DeMille and all of that. And we're going to find out, and we're going to get to see some old time movie stars. Buster Keaton has a very small role playing cards with Norma in her in her uh, card group. And uh, our poor uh, writer here, William Holden, uh, he is sort of like her, her um, boy toy, right? She buys him expensive uh, clothes and jewelry and things like that. And, of course, he doesn't really like the idea of being emasculated, but, uh, but he's going to sort of go along with it for a little while. Okay, wonderful film, one of the all-time great classics. Sunset Boulevard. 
And then uh, my last film with Billy Wilder would be with Marilyn Monroe, Some Like It Hot, 1959. And this didn't. Have, this had trouble with the Hayes Code partly because um, our two male protagonists are um, escaping the mob. Okay, they're escaping the mob. They have accidentally witnessed uh, a gangland massacre. So this movie is set in 1927. I think it's 27 or 29. And uh, so that's during Prohibition. So that's the gangsters and bootleg alcohol and all that good kind of stuff. And these guys are musicians. And uh, after the club is raided where they're performing, they uh, are looking for work. And the only work they can find is in an all-female orchestra or band. And then they accidentally witness the... Uh, real life, there really was, in 1927, a Saint, uh, massacre on February 14th. So heretofore known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So they're going to uh, have sort of their own version of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. They're going to uh, witness it, flee the mob, uh, get in drag, as it's known, and um, get on a train for Florida. And so uh, they are in Chicago, and uh, they're going to get in the train, and they're going to play Daphne and Geraldine, I think it is. Or Josephine, I guess it's Joe and Jerry. So Josephine and Geraldine, but Geraldine uh, um, doesn't like it, so she's going to be Daphne. Anyway, hilarious movie. And uh, your first chance to see Marilyn Monroe. There she is, really at her peak. It's probably her very best film and uh, there's a wonderful scene uh, with uh, some jokes that you might not get. And so I'll explain that when they first meet her on the train, she's going to say, I come from, uh, my name is Sugar Kowalczyk. And she changed it to Sugar Cane. I come from this musical family, she's going to say. My mother was a piano teacher and my father was a conductor. And they'll ask, oh, where did he conduct? And she'll say, on the Baltimore and Ohio. Well, the Baltimore and Ohio is a train, a, a train system. So uh, he's, a, he's a train conductor, not a musical conductor. Anyway, that's the joke. And now you'll get it. And uh, some wonderful lines of dialogue. Uh, that, uh, that uh, When they see her, they look at the way she moves. It's like jello on springs. Wonderful Wonderful dialogue like that. It's really a, really a great movie. And one of the all-time classic endings of movie of movies, really. It's a great ending. So look at some clips for that. Maybe you can find some of those. I think I've got some links uh, to some of those uh, scenes. And, um, and then maybe explore, right? Great stuff. And so the movie was, uh, it, it, it takes place in Florida, but standing in for Florida... Uh, is the uh, the Hotel Del Coronado, and that's in San Diego. Uh, okay, so there we go. Set in Prohibition era, 1929, Chicago, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And uh, some real-life uh, actors who played in the gangster movies back in the 1930s. Okay, so George Raft, who was in Scarface, and he's going to play Spats Columbo. Uh, and uh, if you don't know, Spats are this sort of covering that go over your shoelaces, sort of formal wear. Uh, you might see them uh, in wedding attire. That's about the only formal wear that most people know these days, is uh, get, getting dressed up for a wedding if you're, a, if you're in a wedding. But anyway, Spats Columbo, George Raft was in Scarface. Pat O'Brien often played cops, Irish cops, Pat O'Brien and Joan Blondell. Uh, is uh, Sweet Sue, and she was in tons and tons, not just of gangster movies, but of musicals uh, that were done back in the 1930s as well. So for a 1959 audience, it would be a real thrill to see some of your favorite movie stars from, from uh, uh, 25 years ago, back in the movies. They're not the leads, of course. 
Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon are, but uh, still, it's uh, fun to see, uh, fun to see them in uh, smaller roles. And here we're going to see Tony Curtis, and he uh, steals uh, that uh, nice uh, sort of yachting outfit, and he's going to tell Marilyn Monroe, uh, "See that yacht parked out there? That's mine." Okay, so she's going to believe him. Uh, and so on, and he's going to be doing this odd accent. You might not pick up the accent. It's sort of this odd accent. But basically, he's doing his version of Cary Grant. And Cary Grant was a big, big movie star in the 30s and 40s and 50s. He was in a number of uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock movies and some great stuff. And that odd accent that he's doing, I can't do it, but that odd, uh, that odd-ish accent that he's doing is is uh, Cary Grant. And Cary Grant was alive in 1959, and he loved it. He thought it was just hilarious. Um, and um, and uh, so anyway, uh, Jack Lemmon there on the left, and Tony Curtis, uh, and Marilyn Monroe at the Hotel del, del Coronado. Here's a more recent picture of the Hotel del Coronado in San Diego. Beautiful place. If you go to see it, uh, you can go into the lobby. They have pictures of the film, uh, you know, framed all through the lobby and things like that. And um, Certainly good for extra credit, but I wouldn't ask you to go to San Diego for extra credit. But if you find yourself in San Diego before the semester's over, sure, take a couple of pictures and write it up for an extra credit paper. Okay, so Billy Wilder. Uh, next up, uh, we would be moving on to uh, musicals and Singing in the Rain from 1952. Mostly, this is the one. This is the one that tops the lists as the best musical ever, ever, ever of all time. Singing in the Rain. There are a lot of great ones, American in Paris, and so on. But this has got Gene Kelly, one of the top MGM people. They put lots of money into it. The sets are nice. Uh, it's in color for 1952, and it took color a little while to really hit 100%. And I showed you that color, um, that color graph or that color color chart. Even though it was developed in the early to mid 1930s, it wasn't until about 35 years later, uh, in the late 1960s, that virtually 100% of American movies were in color. And I always contrast that with sound. And sound went from 1927 when it first came in to about 1930, just three years later. Virtually all American movies were sync sound talkies, as they were called. So three years for three years for talkies, and thirty-five years for color. Anyway, MGM they loved using color in their musicals, especially. And Gene Kelly uh, would uh, direct or co-direct and help choreograph and all that. And that uh, wonderful "Singing in the Rain" uh, number that he does. Uh, he was sick at the time. He had a temperature of, I don't know, 102 or 103, something like that. But he, he uh, toughed it out. He knew people were waiting for him. Um, and this is the movie that a little bit of research. I ask you in your papers to do a little bit of research. And you'll, uh, if this is one of the movies you'll watch, you'll see research about how he was sick. And maybe that they had to put, I think, some kind of milk uh, in, with the water so that it would show up on camera. Right? Otherwise, it's a little hard to see water. You have to light it kind of from behind, so it will show up, plus they have to light him from the front. And anyway, they're having a little bit of trouble. Uh, and uh, so it's a sort of a milky sort of a liquid on a classic Hollywood soundstage at uh, MGM Studios in Culver City. And um, great example of a studio film, big studio film, and even though only Gene is in front of the camera, there's probably dozens and dozens of people behind the camera with lights and microphones and, uh, and, um, and the cameras and all sorts of stuff, and they have to play the music back so he knows what to sing to, and actually he would be lip-syncing to himself, uh, and so on. Anyway, a great example of a big studio film, Singing in the Rain. And uh, so it takes place at the beginning of the sound era, uh, right about the same time that 
that uh, Some Like It Hot takes place. So that's kind of interesting, one from 1952, one from 1959. Um, and, you know, Hollywood struggling uh, to get into the sound era is a big part of the film. Uh, it really is an all-time class. It's a comedy, musical comedy. And uh, the leading lady in the 1927 era that Gene Kelly's in, she doesn't have a very good voice for sound. And so they're trying to figure out how they can get Lena in the movies, and they figure out a way of kind of lip syncing and so on. So uh, watch a couple of scenes from Singing in the Rain, including the, the main song. That's easy one to find. And then after that, um, there is a modern movie from 2017, Hail Caesar from the Coen Brothers. I love the Coen Brothers, and we'll be talking about the Coen Brothers later in the class. There's Scarlett Johansson. And just for extra credit, just for extra credit, but check out Hail Caesar because it is set at a studio very much like MGM in the early 1950s. And so that's going to give the Coen brothers a chance to poke fun at uh, actually underwater musicals, uh, cowboy movies, singing cowboy movies, which were kind of a big thing, singing cowboy movies, um, uh, historical epic type movies. There were lots of movies made in the 1950s uh, that took place like a couple thousand years ago. They called them sword and sandal movies. Uh, some were about the life of Christ, and uh, some were uh, with uh, chariot racing and pyramids and all sorts of stuff. And for some reason, that was kind of a big thing uh, in the 1950s. They were big, and they were widescreen, and they had intermissions and all that. And so the Coen brothers get a chance to sort of poke fun at, uh, at all of this and, and the communist witch hunts and all that kind of stuff. So what I, I always would show the, just the trailer of Hail Caesar. And so make sure you watch the trailer for Hail Caesar. It really is a, a fun movie and for extra credit. So sticking with genres from musical, then I would move on to westerns. And really the top Western of all time, too, kind of lucky that they're in the 1950s, would be The Searchers. And on many lists, The Searchers would be at the top. There's our director, John Ford. Below, he won four Oscars for directing, which is the record. And uh, there he is in Monument Valley. I believe that's in Utah. The film says it's set in Arizona, but I think this is in Utah. Beautiful stuff. The movie's in color which was a little unusual for Westerns in the 1950s, but the movie was in color. And uh, we get our star, uh, John Wayne. Classic, uh, iconic Western star, John Wayne, our airport, John Wayne Airport, down in Santa Ana, Costa Mesa there, is uh, John Wayne Airport. It was named after him partly because he had a house on the Newport Peninsula and, um, and had... Uh, a yacht and all that and um, so yeah John Wayne part of Orange County and uh, John Ford and this is a scene from the film and we're gonna get some wonderful tropes shootouts we're not gonna get all of this right we're not gonna get all this that we're not gonna get the saloons and stuff we're gonna get kind of a posse there's an definitely an Indian attack there's a Monument Valley gorgeous Monument Valley it really is something and John Ford liked to shoot in Monument Valley. And uh, so uh, this movie um, was, uh, uh, like you see, really gorgeous and in color and uh, a real classic Western. Let's see what's next. So in the Untamed West, women are kind of equal, equaling or symbolizing, would be a better word, civilization after... Uh, prospectors and trappers and so on um, and and quite likely prostitutes uh, frankly would, would possibly be next but when women start coming out then you're going to start having homes and schools and churches and civilization right you're really gonna have civilization uh, with uh, and, and families and children right all that is going to uh, happen uh, and kind of conversely 
Uh, Europe really loves our Wild West, and back in the 1870s and 1880s, Europeans would come out to America, uh, sort of like uh, tourists, and get all duded up in Western gear and get a nice gun, and they, you could ride across the uh, West on trains. The Transcontinental Railroad was finished in 1869, something like that. Anyway, you could shoot buffalo from the back of the train. As ugly as that sounds, right? They'd just shoot them. They wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't even get them for their meat or their hides or anything. They they just oh look at look at look at that. I, I got I got me a uh, I got me a buffalo, right? But uh, Americans too, not just Europeans. Um, but um, uh, our hugeness, right? All that you travel for days and days and days, and you're not even across the continent. And Europe is much more compact and much smaller than that. The Aboriginal peoples of Europe were long gone by then, um, and uh, we still had, uh, you know, Native Americans, and that was very fascinating. That was fascinating uh, to uh, Europeans, and uh, you know, these canyons and valleys and mountains and all that. I mean, Europe—they've got the Alps and stuff, but it's not nearly so big. You can't just get on a train and travel for three or four days, and still not reach the end. Uh, but for us, uh, we really love. Um, you know, royalty and kings and queens and knights and castles and fairy tales and all of that. It's kind of a what you don't have, you kind of you kind of like or want. Uh, and we're so we're big on all that uh, kind of stuff. Uh, Sleeping Beauty Castle at Disneyland and all those uh, fairy tales and so on. So it's kind of a mutual admiration society. Um, and so back to this uh, women uh, and civilization. I mention that in part because. The crux of the story is there is an Indian attack, and they are going to, and it's based on a real attack, by the way, that happened in the 18, I think the 1830s or 1840s. Some young white girls, as they would have been called, uh, were kidnapped and taken, and our hero, the John Wayne character, he is thinking that he's probably going to have to do an honor killing, okay? So... The idea of being taken by uh, this uh, savage race, as they would have been called, right? By, they would have been called by some people back then, as ugly as that sounds. Um, that uh, when he finds her, um, you know, being taken as the squaw of, uh, of an Indian, Native American, um, that's a fate worse than death. You're better off dead, right, than being an uh, Indian wife. That, that's the thought. That's the thought. That's not my thought. That's the thought that uh, is surrounding this film and that he would be uh, part of. And, and kind of racist, really. Yeah, kind of. Just really racist. Uh, so it's kind of unusual to see that in this film from the hero. And the idea is, is that he would be, um, you know, he's the hero. He's John Wayne. He's, he's a big hero. And he, he's going to find the girl and years are going to go by. Um, when she is uh, she, when she is abducted, she's I don't know nine or something or eight. And as the years go by, he knows she would have uh, reached womanhood and probably taken as a wife and and so on. And he vows when he finds her to kill her. Um, so it's really complicated. It's really complicated. He's not going to spoiler alert. He's not going to. But he's definitely uh, got a real racist streak running through him. Luckily, uh, the guy that he's riding around with is a, a not like that, and he will be the hero by the end of the movie. But it's it's definitely complicated stuff. That's for sure. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna switch now. You might want to take a break. Uh, but we're gonna switch now and talk about the fall of the studio system. And I wanted to tell you about the studio system. Um, in the first class, because basically when the class begins, 1945, uh, we sh very shortly get the fall of the studio system. So I wanted you to know what was falling, okay? What's falling is, um, you know, with the actors under long-term contracts and, and, and vertical integration and all that sort of thing. <coughs> and so um, independent theater owners were not particularly happy with the kinds of deals that they were getting from the studios. 
they had to buy blocks of movies um, or rent, basically, rent blocks of movies. And they didn't even get a chance to see the movies before they were told they had to uh, uh, rent them, choose them. And so they, they took the studios to court, block booking and blind bidding, that was called. Uh, and they took the studios to court, and it reached the Supreme Court right there. That's the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. And the court ruled uh, with the plaintiffs. And they said the studios can't be doing vertical integration anymore. And you're going to have to sell off their theater chains. So that's the very first part of the fall of the studio system. Okay. The second part is that the studio lots are not going to be used so much. And that's valuable land. And when they bought that land in the 19-teens and the 1920s, it was kind of outside of town, right? Downtown LA and Hollywood's 10 or 12 miles outside of downtown LA, orange groves and things like that. And um, now these studios are going to be uh, more in the middle of the city and taxes are going to be higher and that sort of thing. And there's going to be more and more filming on location instead of filming in Hollywood's version of New York or London or Paris. Some directors are going to say, I want to go to the real thing, at least for part of the movie, the outdoor parts. Cameras get a little smaller. Uh, they don't need three strips of film in order to do color and so on. So uh, it's like a factory that's um, not being used, right? Just the just the night watchman's going through and making sure that uh, that uh, you know the Ford plant or the Apple plant or you know you name it is is okay and is safe because they're off somewhere else or it's not being used. Normally with a factory you want it you want it to be humming along. And if it's a really popular product, you might even run three shifts 24 hours a day, cranking out those those iPhones or cranking out those Fords or something like that. Uh, I think this is universal, I'm not sure, and it's more recent. Um, I can't tell these cars, they look like taxis, yellow, they look like they would be taxis. Uh, and I can't tell when this was taken, but it's a nice example of a, of a what they call a back lot. And notice that there's lots, the roads don't go straight. And the reason for that is because if it just went straight, then you'd know that there were trees or mountains or something like that. So the way they would build these would be lots of sort of curves and stuff, even the cities and stuff, so that you would never look off off the set. And the next part of the fall of the studio system, the four parts, <clears throat> actors are getting out of their long-term contracts, five and seven year contracts. This is the biggest actor and the biggest studio head of the 1930s and 1940s. That's Clark Gable, and that's Louis B. Mayer, and um, I suspect that's David O. Selznick. This might have something to do with Gone with the Wind. Anyway, um, instead of a five or seven year contract uh, in the 1950s, the income tax rate was actually uh, quite a bit higher than it is today. And it requires a little bit of a little bit of explaining. Uh, when you hear uh, some uh, candidates running for office talking about a forty or fifty or sixty percent uh, tax rate, basically there are tiers. So if you make up to fifty or sixty thousand dollars, then you're taxed at one rate, and if you make up to a hundred thousand dollars, then from fifty to a hundred is taxed at a different rate. And then if you make over $250,000 or something like that, then anything above $250,000 is taxed at the third rate. So all of your money isn't taxed at that high rate. The first chunk of your money is taxed at the low rate, where most of us are, at least I am. The second part of your money, and I don't know where the, the tables, I don't know how high it goes, but, you know, probably over 100000 or something like that would be taxed at a second rate. And then some people are saying, well, you know, after you make a million or two million dollars, that anything you make over two million dollars should be taxed at a higher rate. So all of your money wouldn't be taxed at 70%, but, but the money that you make from 
one million on opportunity and on upward due tax at that higher rate. Anyway, just wanted to clear that up. A lot of people are confused about that. Uh, so actors back in the 1950s were taxed at a pretty high rate, 90%. 90% of the money that they made over a couple million dollars when you adjust for inflation. Um, so they started getting agents and lawyers, and they started becoming heads of their own corporations so that they could pay themselves. Um, if they had a real big contract, uh, they started working out deals where they would be paid for their movie over a period of four or five years. So, um, you know, uh, 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 wealthy people usually are going to find um, good help uh, with, uh, with accountants and lawyers and things like that um, so that they don't pay the full amount of whatever it was. But it was 90% back in 1950 uh, because of World War II and raising all that money for, for planes and tanks and jeeps and everything. So... Uh, actors start getting agents, they start get, getting them uh, a percent of the film. Okay, so it began in 1950. Jimmy Stewart uh, was a big actor of that era, and a studio wanted him to, uh, or an independent producer wanted him to make a film. His asking price was too high, and they said, well, we can't afford that, and his agent said, well, if you can give Mr. Stewart a percent of the profits, then he will take a much smaller upfront fee, okay, upfront fee, um, and if the movie tanks, then then tough luck for Mr. Stewart, but if the movie's a big hit, then Mr. Stewart will make lots more money, and the same thing that would happen maybe for Clark Gable, or certainly today for Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, or Brad Pitt, or somebody like that, or Sandra Bullock, people would be getting um, Johnny Depp has made hundreds of millions of dollars in profit sharing from the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Uh, so um, that began back in uh, back in the early 1950s. Okay, and this is part of the fall of the studio system. These these uh, profit sharing back end deals and so on. So now the studios aren't they're not just treating them like children, like you do what we tell you to do. They are, um, they're, you know, talk to my agent. <laughs> so um, that's the third nail in the, in the coffin of the fall of the studio system. This takes a while. It doesn't happen, doesn't happen in a year or two. It probably takes uh, 12 or 15 years or so, but it, but it starts. And then the final nail, really, the final nail in the coffin is uh, television. And... At the beginning, the studios ignored television. Uh, later on, they, they fought it. And then finally, after about 10 years or so, they embraced it. And that's really, um, it's really short-sighted. Uh, they seem to do okay with radio. When radio became a big uh, hit in the 1930s, they sort of embraced radio, and they took radio stars and put them in their movies and uh, really sort of sort of swallowed it up and you wonder why did why were they so short-sighted with television um, and but they told their big stars Marilyn Monroe or Clark Gable or Jimmy Stewart don't go on TV right you're a big star you're a star of the big screen the silver screen don't go on that little 21 inch black and white thing right so first they ignored it 48 49 50 51 then it started catching on. I Love Lucy was a big hit. Things like that. So then they fought it and they told their actors to stay away from it. And it wasn't really until maybe uh, 1958 or 1959 when they started really getting involved in producing television programs. They, you know, they had cameras and so on and lights and all that. Television really grew out of radio. It really grew out of radio. The three television networks... NBC, CBS, and ABC were originally radio networks. NBC, CBS, and ABC. They were radio networks, and then they became TV networks. Uh, now today, of course, they're all together, and Disney, and, uh, and Paramount, and CBS, and all that. They're all, they're all together in giant conglomerates. But back then, they were fighting it out. And uh, really kind of short-sighted. Um, why not think about using TV to promote your latest movie. But they 
just weren't thinking that way, right? They just weren't thinking that way. So right here, uh, I would show a documentary about widescreen movies, and uh, you have the link to it. So the whole thing's online. It's about, I don't know, seven or eight minutes. And they're going to talk about pan and scan. Now today, pan and scan isn't such a big deal because most of our flat screen TVs are wider than those, those um, more more square-ish, um, more square-ish uh, uh, television sets. And uh, if you're just looking at this slide here, you see the slide is fairly square-ish, right? It's, it's a little bit more, a little bit wider than it is high. It's about 1.3. But when these wide movies started coming out, you're either going to see a lot of black at the top and the bottom of the movie, or you're going to see like the middle part of the film. Or the camera's going to shoot over here, and then it's going to pan over here, back and forth. That's pan and scan. So uh, that's all going to get explained in that wonderful uh, documentary from Turner Classic Movies. So right here, that's where you would uh, watch that documentary. And... Um, I put Forbidden Planet up because when, in class I recorded it off air and it came after Forbidden Planet. And Forbidden Planet is such a cool movie. Uh, usually I talk about Forbidden Planet for a little while, so I would watch the trailer for Forbidden Planet. I think I have the link for that. Um, it, very influential for uh, Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek and very influential for George Lucas and Star Wars. Uh, it's an interplanetary crew, much like Star Trek. Uh, and then there are scenes that you will see that look like every Star Wars scene where the Jedi Knights battle with, have a lightsaber battle. One of those giant, huge, like you can't even see the bottom of the power generating thing, Death Star Station, something like that. Uh, and there's a scene uh, in this film, somewhere in the middle of this film, uh, that's just like that, and um, so uh, I would uh, I would uh, check around for some scenes in Forbidden Planet. It's very cool. The other thing that's cool about Forbidden Planet uh, for the 1950s, it was in color. It was big budget, and most sci-fi movies of the 1950s weren't in color, and weren't big budget, and they weren't widescreen. And it's also actually based on a Shakespeare play um, called The Tempest. And in the Tempest, uh, a, a sailing ship lands on an island. And, of course, here in the movie, a spaceship lands on a planet. And the planet has been long abandoned by a far superior race of unseen space aliens, which sounds exactly like a Star Trek plot. Uh, they, I think they borrowed the whole plot for it. I don't know. Um, anyway, Forbidden Planet. Very cool movie if you're into sci-fi. Um, robots. Uh, some of the effects were done by people at the Disney uh, company. A animated uh, uh, the monster and some of that stuff are, are sort of animated. Um, and uh, so it's a very, very cool movie. But at the end of the movie, uh, there's the Turner Classic Movies uh, mini doc on letterboxing. And so uh, on the way to the letterboxing doc, I usually stop for a detour on uh, Forbidden Planet. And uh, just uh, the way aspect ratios work, this is the way television and old movies before 1950 would be, right? It's called aspect ratio, and it's about one unit by one and a third units, right? So it's about 1.3 by one, okay? Um, or four by three would be the other way of putting it. Um, most movies today are, well, first off, our flat screen TVs are like this, and our computer screens are like this. Slightly wider are most movies, the vast majority of movies, U.S. theatrical showings since the 1950s, 1.85 by 1. But uh, there are also widescreen movies, and there are still widescreen movies today that are 2.39, almost 2.4 times as wide, so we take one unit, two units, and 40% of a third unit, okay? So no matter how big it is, it's 2.39 by one, right? So there's the one 
and there's a 23.9. Okay, don't worry about all these numbers. I'm not going to ask this stuff on tests or anything, but I just want you to know why uh, there's letterboxing and why, uh, you know, movies seem to be of different sizes. Some of the early movies, like um, maybe Sunset Boulevard and some of that stuff that we watch in this class are going to be uh, of the square uh, aspect ratio, certainly. Double indemnity is going to be of the older aspect ratio. Um, and then by the end of the semester, uh, we'll be watching movies that are uh, widescreen. Okay, so again, don't worry about all the numbers. Don't worry about all the numbers. I just want to put that up for comparison's sake. So there is an unintended consequence of all this, and that is the rise of drive-ins. And so in the post-war baby boom, there are uh, lots of babies that are being born that weren't born during the Great Depression of the 30s or during the war years of the 40s. So sort of pent up, you know, people wanting to start families, not being able to start families really because of economic uncertainty or certainly war, pretty uncertain times. And then when every, all the men and women come back from Europe and come back from the Pacific and uh, start having all of the children that might have been born uh, in the in the late 30s, certainly, in the 30s and in the uh, war years of the 40s. And so that uh, spike in population growth from 1946 to 1960 or so, those 15 years, uh, are known as the baby boom, right? And now uh, all baby boom, all the boomers, okay, okay boomers, all the boomers, are reaching retirement, but, you know, they were kind of the big thing there for the longest time because there's so many of them, and, of course, that's where the money is with the, with the big crowd. So so working its way through the 1960s and, uh, and uh, the anti-war and the Vietnam era and all that, those are the boomers, right, sort of running things for the longest time. And, interestingly, uh, around 1960, uh, a third, almost a third of all screens in the U.S. are outdoors, okay, drive-in screens, almost a third, so that's really something. That's an awful lot, and it, so if you have a family, first off, a, a lot of the big movie theaters are downtown, just like the Chinese theaters, they're downtown, um, and if you've got little infants and things like that, uh, and maybe they're crying or squirmy or who knows what, right, it's tough for a parent to take, you know, infants to the movies, but if you go in your car, then then they can cry and squirm and do all of that, and um, and it's not so bad. And in uh, a number of uh, drive-ins, right down here, they would put playgrounds, like mini playgrounds, uh, uh, um, swing sets and teeter-totters and so on, and the parents could sort of watch their kids and watch the movie until the kids get tired, and then they could climb into the back seat of the car and go to sleep, and parents could watch the rest of the movie. So uh, that's sort of unintended, right? That's not one of the causes of the fall of the studio system, uh, but it's sort of unintended consequence of all of that. And I was a child of the drive-in era. Here is my drive-in. And uh, in Cairo, Michigan, some of Michigan. And the story it's so really perfect. It's just a perfect story. That drive-in screen blew over in a big storm somewhere in the 80s. It blew over a big storm somewhere in the 80s. Drive-ins weren't that big a thing anymore, and so whoever owned the property just, I guess they chopped it up and hauled it to the trash or something like that. And now in that same exact spot is, are you ready? A Walmart. So, very perfect, right? A Walmart, I can take my car there, go to Walmart, when I go back to visit my mother, turn the car, face the screen, close my eyes, pretend I'm back in high school at the Kiro drive-in. And again, lots of B movies. At the, now today, if you go to the drive-in, you're gonna see whatever's playing in all the theaters. Uh, but for a while, drive-in movies were sort of cheesy and cheap and whatever. So here at the drive-in, Kiro drive-in, look at that. A dollar per car load. This must have been toward the end. Um, this wasn't, but, you know, 
God's Little Acre, Tobacco Road, Let No Man Ride My Epitaph, Tales of Terror, definitely be movies. Uh, so, kind of cool. Okay, definitely be movies at the drive in. Okay, and I think the last, oh, I got a few more things to do here today. Let's see here. McCarthyism and the Red Scare. Communist witch hunts, an overreaction really to post-war communist gains led by Senator Joe McCarthy. Okay, so this is kind of an ugly time in America and kind of an ugly time in Hollywood. Uh, a lot of Hollywood writers uh, were, were sympathetic, you might say, to all this. And Senator Joe McCarthy, seen right here, uh, was a leading proponent of rounding up all of the communists or communist sympathizers. A communism, of course, red, right? The red flag, all that. So sometimes if you're sympathetic, you would be pink or pinko. That was another derogatory term, pinko. Um, and... Uh, so it really did hit, it's a political thing, but it really did hit Hollywood uh, as this overreaction to all this. And th so there were uh, blacklisting, and the reason for the blacklisting was, uh, it was a secret list. Uh, do not hire this person. And part of the reason for that was that it's not illegal to be a communist. It's not illegal in America. It's not illegal to be a fascist or a white supremacist. None of that stuff's illegal. What's illegal is, you know, to, to, pick, to take up arms and try to overthrow the government by violent means. That's what's illegal. Okay, a coup, right, with, with armies and guns and tanks and all that. But just being uh, a communist or being a fascist or white supremacist or anything is not illegal. Okay. Uh, but there was a big fervor that there were, there were communists in the government. There were communists teaching our children, and, and so on, or so they thought. So they thought, and very much an overreaction. And um, so the studio said, well, we can't just fire these people because they will sue us and they will win. It's, it's not illegal uh, to be a communist, and, and if we just fire them for being a communist, then they'll sue us and they'll win. And so you uh, people in Congress, you senators and congressmen and women in Congress, you need to make it a law. And they said, well, we're not, we can't make it a law because that would go against the Constitution. <laughs> so they couldn't constitutionally do it, but what they did, sort of nefarious and underhanded, was they just said, we don't have any more work for you. You don't have any more work. So there was a blacklist, like a secret list, and all of a sudden these, these writers, a lot of writers, but actors and actresses, couldn't find work mysteriously. So it really did affect Hollywood. Um, and so there would be loyalty oaths. And really, the ugliest part of all is turning in your friends. I mean, it's one thing to say, I was a communist in the 1930s. It was during the Depression. Everybody was out of work. Um, it looked like, you know, there's no rich, there's no poor, we're all the same. And so I went to some meetings, somebody might say, right? Somebody might say. Um, and then the war broke out and I joined up and fought and so on. And now it's 20 years later, right? Now it's 20 years later. Now it's the 50s. And where are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? People would be asked, are you now, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And, and they could say, well, I'm not now, but I was. And then they'd say, who else? Who was at that meeting? And that's where it gets really ugly. Do you really want to turn in your friends? Right? You want to turn in your friends and say, it was at so-and-so's house. And imagine today, right? Imagine today that you get pulled over and they find some alcohol in your car, and you're not 21, and somebody says, uh, okay, you're, you know, uh, open container, right? That's against the law. 
but we'll go easy on you if you tell us who bought that beer for you. So are you going to tell on your friend who bought your 21-year-old friend? Are you going to tell on your friend, turn them in, or not? Okay, and that's where it gets kind of tough, right? If you have a record, maybe it might be hard for finding a job or transferring to other colleges, things like that. On the other hand, right, there are people, your friends, possibly, um, that you would be turning in. And that's where it gets very, very ugly, right? We all make our own decisions, and people in the 19, late 40s and early 50s were asked to make those kinds of decisions. So, uh, there is a, uh, well, let's move on. There were 10 in particular. They're called the Hollywood 10. They are writers who refused to testify, held in contempt, a short jail time, and then they were blacklisted. And the most famous was Dalton Trumbo. There he is, right there. Brian Cranston played him in the movie, so I would be showing that trailer called Trumbo right about now. And um, in the movie, we see how Trumbo uh, went under an assumed name and others would find a front, someone with a clean name, although not quite as good a writer, likely, but someone with a, with a, with a clean record, clean name, and here's my script, put your name on it, turn it into the studio, and I'll give you, you know, whatever. 5%, something like that. I'll give you some, some of that if you turn in that script. And so uh, they did, right? So there were fronts, blacklists, uh, all that. And I think, I think these are Trumbo's children. And I don't know who, I'm not sure who they all are. I can't quite tell. Uh, but I know that's Dalton Trumbo for sure. And uh, he won a couple of Oscars while he was blacklisted under assumed names. And the Writers Guild has tried to rectify all that over the past half century or so and uh, putting the correct credits on movies. In one case, uh, I think it's Bridge on the River Kwai, the Oscar went to a man who can't even write in English. Right? He's French. And uh, it was based on his book, Pierre Boulet. He also wrote Planet of the Apes, by the way. Um, anyway, he won the Oscar for Best Screenplay, and he can't even he can't even write in English. And so it became kind of a joke, uh, really, uh, uh, assumed writers. And frankly, you know, I think the Hollywood studios are uh, were conservative and they were worried, but I think they were more worried about the public, and the perceptions on the public and the perceptions on their business. I, I think they just, if you're talented, you're talented. I don't really think that they cared about if you were a communist or if you were homosexual or anything like that. And there are lots of instances of closeted uh, gay men and women who really couldn't be outed because of the fear of the public perception. Uh, the studios, they, they knew. There, there were a number of, of, of gay directors, and they knew they were gay, and they figured as long as they were in the closet that everything would be fine, but if the public found out, then maybe the public would stop going to see movies directed or written or starring uh, certain people. But I, my gut feeling is, is that the, the studio heads really didn't care. It, it was more of a business decision than some sort of a moral uh, decision. It's my gut feeling. So uh, right about here, I would show a wonderful documentary on Hollywood aliens and things and about the Red Scare. And there were a number of wonderful uh, allegorical movies. And you guys know allegory from high school, uh, The Crucible right, was, was uh, you know, about witch hunts, right? They called them the communist witch hunts. Uh, you probably know about um, Animal Farm, right? Another allegory about communism. So uh, that's what they were doing in the 1950s. 
uh, Invasion Body Snatchers and Invaders from Mars. Uh, I have the link for you. You can watch the trailers and maybe some scenes from both of those movies. They're very cool. Uh, Invaders from Mars is in color. It's a very, very cool movie. It frightened the heck out of me because uh, people are pulled down into the sand pit, and we had a big sand pit right behind our house in uh, in Cairo, Michigan. So it was it was pretty terrifying for me. But the uh, aliens are going to take out take over normal people. Right? Just like commies are going to take over regular Americans. Right? So that's the allegory. You can either see it as a nice sci-fi movie, or you can see that this is sort of the, the, the stand-in for normal uh, Americans. Because you can't tell. You can't look at somebody and tell if they're communist. Right? Just like in these movies, you can't look at the pod people or the people that have been taken over by the aliens and tell that they are uh, that the aliens are the puppet masters and all of that, right? So that's the that's the allegory. If you're a little kid, uh, then okay, it's a scary movie. But if you're an adult, maybe you get uh, the idea of uh, of the of the allegory and uh, and communism and all that. So check out uh, those uh, two films. And along uh, the same lines, moving on. We have On the Waterfront by Ilya Kazan. Kazan is the name of the director. And he named names. Kazan named names. Not Brando. Kazan named names. And so in this movie that's set on the waterfront uh, where the dock workers would be, the longshoremen would be, Marlon Brando, as Terry Malloy, must testify against the mob who rule the waterfront by fear. So, here, in On the Waterfront, the hero will testify. Right? The hero will testify. And that's sort of Kazan saying that he testified during the McCarthy communist witch hunts because he's heroic. He's not a rat. He, he wasn't a, he's not ratting out his friends who are communist and naming their names. He is taking a heroic stand. So there's a wonderful scene with Marlon Brando um, in, uh, in On the Waterfront with his brother. And the Brando character in the movie, uh, before he starts working on the waterfront, was a boxer, pretty good boxer in the movie. And he was told by the mob to throw some fights so that they could bet against him. Even though he was favored, they could bet against him, they could make some money, but in the meantime, he is throwing fights and not winning them and becoming very uh, disillusioned and dissatisfied, very angry, right? He thought he could have been a, a contender, as he says in the movie. I could have been a contender. And he has to throw some of these fights. So he is going to meet a, a, a pretty young girl and a fiery... Catholic priest and uh, start learning a little bit about his conscience and that sort of thing. Okay, so that is Elia, E-L-I-A, Elia Kazan's answer on the waterfront. And Brando is a method actor. Do I have a method actor in here? Uh, well, let me just add that in. He was a method actor. Write down M-E-T-H-O-D, a method actor for some reason. Hold on, let me let me check and see. There we go. Okay, I, I have it. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't sure. So, uh, in uh, the next, uh, uh, another film, The Wild One, from 1953. Brando's character was a nonconformist. Not really a beat or a beatnik, but definitely a nonconformist. And he studied method acting. And I don't know if they were in the same class with James Dean, but over the years, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and um, lots of uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, lots of uh, uh, actors have studied method acting. And Part of it is a more naturalistic way of acting, getting into character. 
if you are going to be a taxi driver, like De Niro was, a taxi driver, then go drive a taxi. See what it's like. See what that world is like. Um, and really become that character. Don't just memorize your lines, but become that character. And so uh, Marlon Brando uh, did some work in the theater on stage. He met Ilya Kazan. He learned method acting, made a couple of movies with him, was a nonconformist on stage, well, in life too, and I have some nice uh, links to some YouTube clips from this film as well. Uh, it's really a fun film uh, as a uh, motorcycle rider. And the, very cagely, the writer, director, producers of the movie uh, don't make the motorcycle gang the bad guys. The bad guys are a rival motorcycle gang who are causing havoc in this small town um, and uh, they're destroying things and, and uh, uh, causing trouble. Uh, it's based on a real event that took place in the 1940s in California. A giant motorcycle gang came into a small town, Stockton, I think it is. They still have a big rally in Stockton every year. And um, uh, uh, since, I guess since then, I, <laughs> maybe they're paying, maybe they're paying homage or respect or something like that, but uh, there's still a big, it's still a big rally. And um, if you saw Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, you might remember Shia LaBeouf's character was dressed like that. Um, and so very definitely the movie was set in the 1950s. The Shia LaBeouf character would have seen this movie, and that's who he's paying homage to. Okay, all, all the leather and the jeans... Uh, uh, and so on, right? Good kids didn't wear jeans, okay? Good kids wore slacks. Jeans were for motorcycle kids or possibly farm kids, but, but not nice middle-class kids. Uh, but by the 1960s, uh, with the hippies and bell-bottom blue jeans and all that good kind of stuff, all that fashion stuff's going to change. So, uh, Marlon Brando, and we will see Marlon Brando again uh, when we get to The Godfather, right? When we get to The Godfather, uh, we're going to see Brando as... Uh, on Vito Corleone. And sometimes I get to this film on this day, and sometimes uh, I run out of time and have to do it in the next class, but our next film would be Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean, definitely a Hollywood icon. And the movie was in color, and that, that's partly why they put him in that bright red uh, jacket there. Okay, it's not a leather jacket or anything, but it's a bright red, and that's because it was in color, and it looked pretty good in color. And it was a widescreen movie and all that, even though it was kind of set around teenagers. And uh, so part of what we'd be talking about in the 1950s is conformity, nonconformists. A lot of people said, gee, we've been through this big depression. We've been through a world war. Everybody just go along and get along and don't cause trouble. Don't rock the boat, right? Just, just take it easy. It's the 1950s. And a lot of people, um, like our president, frankly, uh, remember the 1950s as a really uh, wonderful, heady time for America. And we really stood like a colossus over uh, the world. Uh, a lot, so much of the world had, had uh, damage and destruction from bombing. Uh, in Europe and in the Pacific uh, from the war. And aside from Pearl Harbor, we were pretty much left untouched uh, here in uh, the U.S. or the continental U.S. And so the 1950s, uh, in a lot of people's minds, was a really great time to be alive. And yes, it would have been a great time to be alive if you were a white male. Okay, If you were a white male... Okay, then, yeah, sure. But, boy, if you were female, if you were black, African-American, African-American, Hispanic, not really a great time. Not really a great time. So anytime you hear somebody talking about how wonderful the 50s were and, and a chunk of the 60s, you kind of have to remember it's probably coming out of the mouth of a white male. Um, and, uh, frankly, not really a great time for a lot of other people. The schools were segregated. Uh, African-Americans were sent to 
uh, inferior uh, schools uh, in public. There would be separate bathrooms, separate drinking fountains, um, served in the back, uh, only takeout in restaurants, never for dine in. Uh, they would be sitting in the balcony of movie theaters, all that, all that segregation stuff. I don't want to get too far into it, but that's all from the 1950s and 1960s and not really a fantastic time. So the next time anybody talks about wonderful 1950s, maybe you remember that. Uh, in any event, uh, James Dean um, was uh, definitely an icon. He made just three uh, movies. Uh, and there we are in Rev Without a Cause. There is a switchblade fight. Right, switch a, a spring-loaded blade. They're illegal. I remember uh, you you had to go to Tijuana to get a switchblade, and maybe even today. I don't know if they have switchblades in Tijuana today or not. It's been a while since I've been there, but uh, that was kind of the the thing, right? You'd have to go to Tijuana to get a switchblade. But gangs, uh, not guns so much in the fifties, but gangs with uh, switchblades and maybe chains and things like that. And so he's forced. To be in this fight, the James Dean character, he his parents keep moving from from school district to school district because he keeps getting in trouble and that sort of thing, and he's having uh, anger issues and this and that and the other, and he does a little bit of acting out, and so this gang uh, guy here uh, challenges him to a switchblade fight uh, at the uh, Griffith Observatory, very cool place, the Griffith Observatory, up in Hollywood. And shockingly, James Dean died in a car accident. He had a Porsche Spider, I believe, 9, September 30th, 1955, I believe it is. He just ran into a tree or a sign or something like that up in, in central California. And it really shocked Hollywood and the whole world. He was a big star. He'd only made those three movies, East of Eden, Giant, and Rob Without a Cause. And he was nominated for Oscars and so on. Uh, and he was 20 or 26 or 27 years old, something like that, uh, when he died. So James Dean never got old and uh, became an icon. And if you were to go up to Griffith Park today, the observatory, then you will see this uh, bust of James Dean. And you can uh, go and take your picture next to it. <laughs> Frame it up just like that so you can see the Hollywood sign right back there, and I don't know who this is from online, so I don't know who this young lady is, um, but you can go up to the uh, Griffith Observatory. It's a planetarium. It's a planetarium, and uh, and it's in lots of movies. It's in um, uh, Men in Black and tons and tons of movies, um, and so the, the, at some point they put this up, sort of representing all the many Hollywood movies that were shot at the Griffith Observatory. Okay, phew. Uh, that's a long day. It seems to me normally I have to do Rub Without a Cause in the subsequent class because it is kind of a long day and I'm out of breath, but we are done for class two. This would be the uh, second class, I believe. I think I have that right. All right, let me figure out how to stop this.